Welcome back to the Cheap Heat Productions podcast. Oh, I fucked it up. I'll do it again. <laughs> Welcome back to the Cheap Heat Productions podcast. Okay, welcome back to the show. And today on the show, I'm joined by a guest that many of you will recognize from the horror world. Wow. It's Miss Beatrice Babel. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. Talk about cheap heat. I'm feeling cheap. I'm menopausal, so anyway. <laughs> Most of you won't know about that yet, but whatever. <laughs> it, it will, your day will come as well. <laughs> um, I just want to talk to you about growing up and the journey into movies was it something that you always wanted to do or did you have any other loves prior to going into movies well, and tv um, obviously yeah uh, i kind of i loved acting since i was since i can remember um i was a i was in um my first play in kindergarten and kindergarten for me was in japan um we lived in japan when i was a little oh, really bit. yeah and because i couldn't speak japanese yet because we had just moved there um I got to play a sheep. Let's see. I got to play a sheep in a in a Christmas play, and then I got to play a dog. You know, I played all these animals. So I couldn't speak, but um, you know, I, I always loved the stage. And then um, in middle school and high school, I was always involved in drama, um, and I was in the plays there as well. And then I won the trophy one year for you know best actress award for some play that I was in. Um, and that I think kind of sealed it, but uh, but the second love I have is horses, and um, so I was really torn when I was in high school between going to into horses um, equestrian, some kind of whether it was training horses, raising horses. I not veterinary because I'm not really into blood too much, but um, yeah, I'm a horror film actress. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, um, but what, what it came down to was money. Um, when I was going to apply at schools, um, we had a great theater program in our local university. And this was in Canada, uh, Victoria, British Columbia, where I was living at that time. Um, but then I applied to some equestrian colleges. And a lot of them were like in Tennessee and, you know, down in the States. And I just couldn't afford it. It was way too expensive. So I ended up going the theater direction. Um, and I was lucky enough to be living in British Columbia. Um, Vancouver, which uh, is called Hollywood North, um, if any of you are aware, so many films and and most a lot of the TV shows you watch are actually filmed in Vancouver, even mm -hmm. if you have um, exteriors in New York or other cities, it's most of the filming is done in Vancouver. So there's lots and lots of work. So it's a great place for an actor to get start started. Um, you know, then eventually I made my way to L.A., but. Yeah, it was basically finances. So it was going to be horses or acting. And I did end up doing a little bit of both in that um, while I was in Vancouver as an actor, um, my agent, I convinced him and we bought a horse. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a pet horse. So, you know. Yeah, I actually had uh, Ken Kersinger on the show a couple of weeks ago and he played uh, Jason, as you know, in Freddy vs. Jason. And that was filmed in Vancouver as well, okay. which was handy for him because it was because he, he's Canadian as well. So. Um, yeah, I've heard a lot of people saying about Vancouver that's really popular to film stuff in. So that's very interesting. Yeah, and it's it's beautiful too. It's a really beautiful um, place if you've never been. British Columbia is just stunning. Do you think working in theater helped you for your auditions for movies? Um, for sure. I think you know the the core of acting is is the same no matter what you do. It's getting in touch with a character and and um trying to be real with your emotions bringing it out you know truthfully um so that part um is the same and the theater training definitely helped you know with character recall and all the kind of stuff that we did for uh, in theater school 
Um, however, technique is very different. Um, and my my theater training was, um, you know, all the classics, you know, Shakespeare for endless, endless, endless hours and hours and hours of Shakespeare um, every day. But um, it was wonderful. So um, it did not prepare me for film and TV, the, the difference. Um, I think most theater schools now really incorporate both. Um, so the one thing that I would say is that like the first TV shows I did, I, I was way too big. My performances were like over the, over the top because yeah, stage, you know, you do need to project further back, you know, but on film, you just need to, you know, just do the slightest thing with your eye. You know, you really don't need to do like, you know, that's, that just looks yeah. like, and big on, on film. So I think my first few performances, I'm like, I'm embarrassed. I cringe when I look at them, but you know, you got to start somewhere. I think probably a lot of it is in when you're doing theater as well, you, you have a crowd there and you want to impress them and they kind of want reactions and they kind of want sometimes off the cuff kind of things that's not scripted as well. Right. Oh, which yeah. which actually, I mean, in film and TV, you can do as well. It depends. Um, it's in some ways, maybe more often people go off the script in, in film and TV, I would think. It totally depends on the producer and the director. It depends on, you know, who's there and, and what what kind of vibe some people are really you got to skip st stick to the script um and i think more so in in theater because especially classics everyone knows the lines so if you go off book it's not so great um although you sometimes do have to improvise if something strange happens but in film there's a lot more room i think to um improvise a little bit and go off book yeah, I was reading on your on your pages that uh, you were on Twenty One Jump Street, the TV show. Is that any affiliation with the current, well, recent kind of films, or is that completely different? Well, the um, the original TV show was um, was exactly that. It was the the original TV show starring Johnny Depp, which I think everyone knows Johnny Depp from yeah Pirates of the Caribbean and all all the other things. Um, so I I was fortunate enough to work with him. The films. Um, I have to be very honest. I, I, I haven't seen them. Um, I imagine it's from the same licensing people. Um, but, and actually, were there some of the same actors? I don't, probably not, because. I didn't even know about this until I was kind of researching and I seen this is the thing. Now, I haven't seen the movies either. They're not my types of movies, as you can see from my T-shirt and uh, Chucky being on there. Right. You're not wearing my son, I noticed. Mm. No, no. I have only this at the moment. And, uh. My uh, my two year old is going around saying Chucky, Chucky now at the moment because he sees he's seen him on my t shirt and on my YouTube. I had YouTube on the television the other day and I recommend a video come on and he said Chucky, 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 oh cute, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some people find it horrific, but I think it's kind of cute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I always am surprised with some of the young fan, like the young kids that fans will bring to these things and. You know, when the little kids say, oh, yes, I've seen those movies. I love Freddy, you know, and <laughs> Freddy Krueger and things like that. You're kind of like, oh, OK. I didn't let my own kids see my movies, you know, but um, and now that they're old enough, they don't want to, which is really mean and rude. <laughs> not in it and they won't even see my movies. But um, but anyhow, yeah, no. So 21 Jump Street, the TV series, I guess you hadn't heard of it. You know, it was really big here in the 80s, 80s and it is where Johnny Depp got his big start. Yeah, well. Um, before Nightmare on Elm Street, then, part five that you were in, what other kind of roles were you doing, or does anything stick out that... What's your favorite movie that you've been in? Um, well, for for my own acting, um, matinee, actually. Uh, let's see. Poster. Yep. Here's the poster back there. And then also Quarantine. Which we know all about at the moment. Yes, we all want to see that that one with a gun holding the gun. That's me. Yeah. And here, down here, is me. But anyway, um, those are both um, lo very low budget um, Canadian uh, films. Matinee is sort of like a, a horror film. It takes place during a horror film festival, and then Quarantine, of course, is like now, it, even though it's uh, made in 1989, but it is a, you know Quarantine because. Um, a disease has set over the land. It's a science fiction dystopian future thing. And there's this crazy senator who takes advantage of the disease to quarantine anybody who is a political enemy, anyone he doesn't like. Um, and so there's the haves and the haves nots, um, kind of a similar situation as is happening now. So it, it, even though it's not the best quality film and 
there's a lot of, you know, the writing, it's, it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a great film, but it's very timely and I star in it. So, yeah. <laughs> so find it and watch it. No. Um, but it was the, it was the most fun to do, I guess, purely because I starred in it. So I, I had, you know, I had a lot of, um, screen time. So I got to really be, you know, using my chops for it. Um, I, I, again, it wasn't like the best script. I think probably the best scripted thing I'd ever been in um, in film would have been Stakeout uh, with Richard Dreyfuss and Emilio Estevez. And I had a very small role. I know they always say no small roles, only small actors, but you know, I, I only had like two or three sh short scenes, yeah. but it was, but the work, I was proud of that film because it was a great film. Like I would, I would recommend it to anyone. Um, whereas quarantine, you know, it's, for sure, if you can watch it for free, it's fine. It's a, you know, a couple, an hour and a half of entertainment. Um, but I, I can't really recommend it as a great film. Um, but it has its merits and, and the same with matinee. But so, yeah, those were my favorite just because I got a lot of screen time and I got to act, you know, for a lot longer. Um, it was fun. Though I've never yeah. played... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say on film and TV... Let me think. Yeah, I never got to, I haven't yet been able to play a character, you know, really different from different from me. I mean, they all were different in that um, um, I didn't play, I've never played an actor or, or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm either a nun or a, a doctor, yeah. or, you know, I got to play all these different kinds of people, but I'd like to, um, you know, I'd like to do something like really kind of crazy different from me. One of yeah. these days. And are you still oh, are you are you still actively involved in the movie scene or what's your situation at the moment? So my situation is that I will be returning to okay, cool. film. Yeah. I, I made a conscious of decision um when I was after doing Elm Street, I'd been active for I would say a chunk my career was really ten ten years, a decade yeah. where I was working very active during film, TV, stage, radio all the time and i actually was kind of at the height of my career um where i could get like a lot of roles and um unfortunately i kind of left it off because of a relationship because of a guy yeah. um i was in this codependent relationship we kept breaking up getting back together breaking up getting back together and i just was at that point that i knew i had to leave so i just um took off there was a number of things that led to it but i ended up taking off moving to taiwan um, and wow. yeah, you've been everywhere. Yeah. So I was in Taiwan for about a year, just under a year of teaching, acting in English. And then my spiritual teacher was going to be in India in the ashram in India. So from Taiwan, it wasn't so far. So I flew there planning to be there just for a week. And my teacher said, stay. So I dropped everything and stayed. And I ended up living in India for two years, um, doing volunteer work in a mobile hospital and, um, that kind of really changed everything. My whole focus, I was going to devote my life to my spiritual practices. Um, and I actually wanted to stay in India and do the volunteer work and not even get married or anything. But mm -hmm. after two years, of the day I decided to stay, my teacher kicked me out and sent me to with a one way ticket to New York. Um, and I'd never been in New York and um, long story short, that's where I ended up getting a temporary job just to pay my bills. And I ended up meeting a man who ended up being my husband. Um, and when I, when we decided to get married and have kids, it was very late in life. You know, I was almost 40. Um, and I decided, you know, if I'm going to have children this late in life, then I'm going to do it full time. You know, I'm not gonna, mm -hmm. um, and we were fortunate enough in a position that my husband could support us. Um, you know, even though we took a huge pay cut with just one salary, but I stayed home and raised my kids, um, and got into more, um, into yoga and I had a I had and have a yoga studio and a yoga online business. So I really stepped away from acting and I decided to just focus on my kids. I did, I snuck, in, you know, in a few things. I did some student films under my married name and I did a few local plays. Um, yeah. Regional theater, but I never used my professional name because I'm union. You, know, I'm you were just, you were just kind of edging yourself back in, were you? Yeah, and just having fun yeah. with the acting, but you know, I, I didn't do any union work. Um, so, but now my both my boys are in college as of this September, and so I'm going to start working my way back. 
do you have anything lined up? Um, I do have, there's one, um, another horror film in the works and surprise, surprise, it's a nun. This oh my was, God, again. Yeah, this is kind of one of the reasons I, I one of the re reasons that led me to kind of leave LA was after, in Canada, I was so used to having such a wide range of roles as an actor and in Canada, they really allow you to act, just act. So you might be the lead in a film then you might take a small role in something, then you might be on stage and then you might do radio and then you might do a commercial. And there wasn't this kind of judgment. And I think even now in the U S it's starting to open up more. You see, um, I think because of cable and streaming and stuff, mm -hmm. a lot of film actors are now doing TV stuff, but back in the day you were either a film actor or a TV actor or a stage actor in, at least in LA. And within that, they also categorized you, unless you were a huge, big star, unless you're in the A or B list where you could, you know, command your own shows, you had to take whatever they gave you and they would kind of put you in a box. So after Elm Street, they put me in this box as a uh, horror film actor. And yeah. that's the only kind of scripts I got. And I, a lot of them just were not well written. And I, you know. In retrospect, maybe I should have just done them all, but at the time I was still too too close to theater school, and I was like, "Oh, I'm not going to just do all these crappy screen screenplays." So that was one of the reasons I left. But um, you know, so I, I didn't like that they just have to put you in a file cabinet, you know, and put you. Yeah, on I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I, I you know I noticed that a lot of actors, good actors, will only be in horror movies. Right. You, you know, know and yeah, and that's all they get over and over. So. Um, now I'm kind of more open as long as it's an interesting thing. Um, but in the, in the film that I've, I'm, I've been offered is they want me for the nun, you know, very original. So I said, um, but then there's this beast at the end and I said, can I play the beast? And they said, no, no, because they have, um, they have a stunt, not, you know, a martial artist to do it. And I said, well, then can I at least be the voice? And they're considering that. So that okay. would be fun. Yeah. You don't want to be, all this time outside a movie and then come back and then bam, you're unknown again. Yeah. 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 So, so I'm looking for anything creative. If there's anyone listening or watching that, that has some creative script with a old lady, old lady. Who? <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of nightmare on Elm street, obviously we can't not talk about it. Um, but I'm not going to focus this interview around it. What I want to know is just how did that audition come about for you? And were you a fan of horror leading up to it? So um, the audition came about my, I had fairly recently moved to LA um, and this was when I had been, I was sort of the it girl in Vancouver at the time. I'd starred in the two um, Canadian films yeah. that in quarantine. I had done Stakeout and 21 Jump Street and all these TV shows. And I was kind of at the height of my career where I really could choose roles. Um, and it was a fantastic place to have stayed. Um, but I followed this guy, the same guy that, why I left the industry, but I followed him to LA. He moved to LA. Um, I think he wasn't very comfortable with me, my success, um, because at the time he was trying to be an actor um, and he was not having that success. Anyway, long story short. So I followed Jealousy. Him. <laughs> sort of. Um, but I followed him down to LA. Um, and in LA, of course, I'd have to start from the bottom because they didn't know these Canadian films. Um, and even though I had a good, strong resume, I was able to get a good agent. Martin Sheen and Charlie Sheen's agent um, took me on, I think because of Emilio Estevez, um, because I had played his wife in Stakeout. Mm -hmm. And she gave me this audition and she said, and I said, a horror film like Elm Street. I remember seeing the original in high school, um, at the end of high school, I guess. Um, and I was terrified, you know, <laughs> and I wasn't really sure I wanted to do a horror film. And she said, no, 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 go. You, you got to meet this director, Stephen Hopkins. So I went and um, it actually was the first audition, maybe the only audition, where they just hired me on the spot. Like in, during the audition, they said, okay, you got the part, you know, which never happens. So it all kind of moved very fast from there. And I think as you probably have heard from other Elm Street and any of the 80s um, film, uh, big horror film um, franchise people, most of us were had no idea. I, I think none of us had any idea how big it was going to be. Yeah, the longevity is absolutely crazy, isn't it? Right, and it seems to almost have a resurgence now. Like, there's so much um, interest in Elm Street. You know, this, um, what's that girl? What I always think, like, not the Simpson. What the heck is her name? Oh, dear. Jenner. 
Kylie Jenner or something like yeah. this. Anyway. Oh yeah, she made some outfit, I think. Yeah, didn't she? Yeah, she made she made a whole makeup line on Nightmare and Elm Street. Oh, makeup. Yeah, just came out now, and you know, there's just this huge resurgence of interest in the '80s iconic horror films. So, um, so that's kind of exciting. And yeah, we had no idea. I mean, I knew it was a big deal playing Freddy Krueger's mother. I mean, that I I had the wherewithal to know that that you know anything yeah. like if you're Frankenstein or Wolfman's, you know, whatever big somebody big's mother is is kind of mm -hmm. a cool cool thing and i love the fact that i tried to destroy him at the end of the, the film and even though i loved him and blah 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 all that stuff but yeah so yeah the, that that's how the audition came it was just very quick and fast and and then they, they hired me on the spot i guess i'd look so much like him <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't say that though no. in the in terms of like we talk about longevity and i want to talk to you about the convention world and probably you haven't got to do many of them over COVID or since COVID, how do you find doing those things? It's it's bonkers, isn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. Well, I, I've been doing actually quite a lot this this past. Um, well, this year um, we've I've done quite a few, and I'm actually coming to the UK. I'm so excited. Um, what is it? The Ham Hampshire Horror Con. Okay. In England. Um, that's next fall, and then my agent has. There's two more in England, I believe. Um, that he's trying to work line up um and just for all of you I'm, I'm listening if you ever want anybody anybody that you want at a at a convention anyone you want to see you have to call the people that are organizing it and request the people because that's yes. we get on their radar so if you you know you say we want some nightmare in elm street people or you know we want www wrestlers or whatever it is you know you you have to ask for us by name and that's how then if there's enough people asking then they ask then they get in touch with our agents um but uh, no, I've been I've been really enjoying it. I when I first started going to conventions maybe ten years ago, I didn't get it the whole thing, um, and I I was kind of embarrassed to be honest with you. I was thinking like, what on earth? You know, we're like I'm, I'm a mom now. I'm not even any doing anything to do with acting, and this was so long ago. But I come to appreciate how much it means to people. You know, the people that grew up on these films idolize the the whole film. You know. The franchise, the franchise or yeah. whatever it impacted their childhood and and for them it's a great excitement to meet the people that created it um and so for me it's an honor to then be able to to share that excitement with the fans and and meet these wonderful fans i mean yeah there's some crazy people but that's true of anything right there's some really really cool people that really got a lot out of the films um, and i've learned so much i've learned to appreciate the elm street franchise because of the fans yeah, and it's nice for you guys to meet up for people that you know every so often. You're meeting in all these cities, and you get to probably go for a meal and catch up and everything. It's nice to have that kind of connection, isn't it? Every so often, absolutely. It's a, this great fun reunion every time we have a convention. I I, I did my first. Um, I did a convention in Brooklyn last weekend, and I was the only <coughs> Nightmare on Elm Street person there. So, and it was it was different. I mean, it was fun. I got to meet. I was sitting next to the guy that played Pinhead in one of the Hellraisers. And then down from me was a woman from Halloween. Um, and then there was um, uh, Dana DeLu De 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 Luca, a wonderful girl who's in um, the current uh, Ash versus the Ash versus the Evil Dead. Yes. Yeah. Um, and she yeah. was so much fun. So it was great, great fun to meet new people. And we all connected really well and had a great time together. But But there's a feeling of, a real reunion when I get together with Elm Street people, you know, I mean, that's my, that's my family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, it's a nice, a nice thing to do. Do you keep in touch with modern horror these days or is it something you watch or do you just stay away from it? Yeah. I'm not really, I gotta say maybe as a mom, I don't know. I, I'm not super into, I've always loved a good, a well-constructed scary movie. Like I loved, and there were a lot of them in the eighties and earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't mind in the summer getting scared, you know, with friends. There's something really cool about it, but it has to have good characters and good story. Yeah. And you know, I'm not crazy about all the just the gore, but um, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a few, there's a few franchises that will remain unnamed out there that uh, just focus on cutting people up and all that kind of thing. I have no interest in it whatsoever. Right, and that's one of the things I, I noticed. There was this um, list of um, they called it the body count, you know, from the Elm Street and the and the Friday the 13th and um, Halloween and, and uh, you know the, the different probably Chucky too you know and they 
they listed how many were dead from each film. And surprisingly, Elm Street, having done like eight films or so, um, there's only 43 victims, whereas the other ones are like hundreds and hundreds. You know, it is something to be said for for the Elm Street franchise and, and Robert England is that, you know, I do like the concept that he he attacks you through your own fears. It was more psychological than it's violent. Like, exactly right and so that you can and you can overcome him by overcoming your fears to a degree you know maybe that's what gave people hope you know but he's over he is destroyed in the end by his victims you know and, and in a clever you know interesting kind of way you know i know they five the one i was in you know probably more consistently is the least favorite or one of the least favorite but then the people that like it really really like it and yeah um, i like it i think it's the best because <laughs> I love that woman who played I, his mother. <laughs> I, li I like five. I like, obviously, one and two. I do like Wes Craven's New Nightmare as well. I thought that was really good. Yeah. And obviously, for the cheese element, I, I have to be a fan of Freddy vs. Jason. Right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's have you, have you Have you seen that movie? I actually haven't, but I'm thinking I will now that I'm meeting more and more of the, the Jason people. Yeah, you'll you'll, you'll have to watch it. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I'm starting to get more into watching all these things and learning more about them, just because I'm spending so many, so much more time at these, these conventions and meeting fans, and it just gives me more understanding of what, what they're talking about. But yeah. um, you know, but I five. I just I was blown away by the by the scenery, the backgrounds that they created, the special effects. To me, were like for such a cheaply made movie and, and quickly made movie. I, I'm blown away by what they achieved. I gotta say. It's crazy when you're looking back on horror films like that and the sets that they made and everything. And now nowadays, maybe you'd get away with making a half set and it could be some CGI or something like that. But right. it's crazy what they were doing in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, even the early 90s as well. Yeah. They created you know? like this whole world you know, <laughs> in these warehouses. But in terms of modern stuff, I actually was surprised. I ended up loving on that uh, Korea's Squid Games. Oh, I didn't see it. I, I, everybody's watching it, but I haven't looked at it yet. I'll wait for a while. I, I watched it only because my sons, you know, my college age boys, trying to find something that we can all enjoy when they're home from college is hard. Mm -hmm. um, our tastes are so different now, but so they wanted to watch that, and I was like, okay, whatever. And then the first, you know, the first episode, it's so much bloodshed, and I was so grossed out. But the characters really gripped me. You know, they were such interesting characters, and they really developed them, and the storyline held me. And, and I hate to say it, but you do get used to the bloodshed after a while. It just sort of becomes like, okay, whatever. You know, I don't know that that's a good thing, but anyway, yeah. I did get kind of used to it. I knew that that's the setup. They're going to die if they, you know, don't do it right. So there was a lot of that gory stuff, but the, but what held it was such interesting characters and, and the, the storyline of how the characters were struggling within themselves with, you know, their guilt and their greed and all that kind of stuff. And, and, Korea is really coming up and or at least we're noticing it more. There's so many interesting films coming out of there. You know, great, um, great actors. So it's good games. That was, yeah. that was cool. What is the funniest thing you've ever seen at a fan convention? Ah, uh, let's see. Um, let me think. Funniest thing at a fan convention, probably. Oh, there was one where um and I won't name which one it was, but uh, it, was, yep. it was very not well attended. And we're sitting there with um, actors from a number of different franchises. And we're all like, you know, at, there was sort of a, a rush of fans for a little while. And then it sort of emptied out and there was hardly anybody. And we're all just sitting there twiddling our thumbs, looking mm -hmm. at each other, you know, looking on our phones and whatever. And somebody said, looked over and said, oh, my God, it's so empty in here. You could hear crickets. I, I don't know if that's a saying in ireland yeah i get the saying yeah, yeah so yeah. it's the same like you know so quiet in here and then seriously like the second after they said that we heard <laughs> you know and we're like what what is someone doing and there literally was a cricket under one of the people's tables it was the wow we laughed that was funny that was strange that's the spooky horror elements of the fan conventions exactly which is something that i i've, I've been kind of playing around with a screenplay um Called Har Convention, and it's okay. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, around a an actress, you know, 
an old lady <laughs> who started. An, un, an unnamed lady. Unnamed lady who was in a horror film, iconic film, you know, 30 some years in the previously. And she's at this horror convention and, you know, it's towards the end of the evening and the place clears out and she, she can't find her agent. And then she's looking around and she's in this huge convention hall by herself and it's getting dark and things happen. Okay. So there's there might be a few things to look forward to both on the script and on the screen from yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah it it was a an absolute pleasure to talk to you today, Beatrice. Thanks for taking the time out. Thank you. It's great talking to you too. And again, congratulations on your second baby. Thank you very much. Uh, I wish uh, you some good sleep. But yeah, sleep sleep is improving, so I'm I'm happy at the moment. So yeah, although I'm Get supposed there. to be telling you never sleep again. So, but you know. Oh shit! I'm in trouble. One, Thanks. Two, my son is coming for you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Alrighty, thank you. Take care.